this morning by reading from the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 3, chapter 8. My youngest friend said we called it the snowman. He looks like a snowman. No, Father, we're so glad we have the freedom and the ability to come together to share not only your love with us, but our love for each other with each other. We thank you that today we can come in in freedom and worship you and praise you and have a Bible of our own and not have to go borrow one or tear the pages out of one. We're so thankful for so many things that we take for granted. We're so thankful for things that we throw away that other people just cherish. We're so thankful today, Lord, that we actually have the word we can read and learn from and have the Holy Spirit bring us revelation to. Lord, let us never neglect. Let us never come to the place in our lives where you're not as important as you should be. Let us never come to the place in our lives where other things matter more than you or your word. Let us come to the place in our lives that we are led by the Holy Spirit to know that you are in everything, you are everything, and nothing happens without your permission. <coughs> Help us to always look to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And faith only comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. So this morning, as we come into a time of fellowship and worship with you, Lord, we pray that we can just let it go and not hold anything back. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who have displayed your splendor above the heavens from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How majestic is your name in all the earth. How important you are, Lord, in all the earth. You are the only big deal that matters. You are the only one that we worship. You are the only one that deserves every fiber of our being to be on you. No matter what happens in our life, no matter what we see with our eyes or hear with our ears, it's all about you. And if it isn't, we need to examine our walk. So this morning, we, when we come into a time of worship, I want you to think about something. Are you worshiping because it's a thing we do? Or are you worshiping because he deserves it? Are you worshiping because he did something fantastic for you last week? Or are you worshiping him because he did nothing last week? Because when you worship God, when nothing seems to be going right, that's worship. When everything's going right in your life, it's easy, oh man, I'm having such a great life. No, when things start turning south, that's when you worship. Because you know in that worship, 
you realize that he's in control and he's master of everything. It's time for God's people to quit making excuses. And it happens every day. So this morning as we worship the Lord, let's worship with every fiber of our being. Shall we? In Jesus' name. Why are we here? Is that worship Jesus? Is that why we're here? Fellowship. You know, so many people miss out on the fellowship with like-minded believers because it's an excuse every Sunday not to come to church. Some of them are legitimate. Car broke down, whatever. Some are legitimate. But when you have, and I don't mean, I'm, I hope you don't get mad at me when I say this. But when you know someone that you can call and say, can you come pick me up from church? You've just made an excuse to yourself not to come. Well, I'll just sit here, I'm going through this hard time. What better place is there to be when you're going through hell than with like-minded people who are probably going through hell themselves? And we build each other up. The Bible in Hebrews says, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. That doesn't only mean come and get what you can. It means come and share the love with everybody else. Because when you don't come share the love with everybody else, I hate to tell you this, you're being selfish. You're being selfish in this way. Well, I don't feel like going. There's people there that need to see you. There's people in attendance who need to know that you're with them in prayer, reading, whatever. But we can be selfish pretty easy, can't we? Lord, if you don't do whatever I ask for the six days, guess what? I ain't going to church. And God says, that's when you need to go to church, boy. I've been there, folks, I know. It's time for God's people to quit looking for excuses not to enjoy God's people. You know, when we have a fellowship time in the morning, you know what my desire is, especially when it's full? That that fellowship and that love for each other continues for the whole two hours we're here. I don't have to preach a word. Honestly, I don't have to preach a word because you're giving each other what you need from each other. Amen? So we can be real selfish by not showing other people how important it is to be gathered with like-minded people. It isn't always about you. It's about Him. And what God can do to them through you. Before I start with message this morning, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 41. <coughs> and we'll see how much we get. Now, some of us in this room, and some people that we know, spend more time in the Word, which is okay, than other people don't. This scripture right here gives you the incentive, if you read the Bible, it gives you the incentive to tell people, look, it's going to be okay. What you're going through is temporary. It's going to be okay. Look at chapter 41 of Isaiah, and I'm going to go to verse 10. Do not fear. Do not fear. For I am with you. God is with you every step of the way. I got a phone call from an individual the other day that could not understand why people, why he can laugh during his, what's going on in his life. And people say, how can you laugh? Because God is still with me. If God be for me, who can be against me? So when you're going through situations and you need someone to build you up, don't stay away from the tool. Join with the whole toolbox. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. Think about that statement for a minute. God's telling you that you are, He is your personal God. Huh? He is your personal
personal Savior. He has created the heavens and the earth for you. Isn't that what it says? I am your God. I am your God. Don't look about you. Don't look crazy about you. I am here and I will never leave you alone. I will never walk away from you. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. This is God Almighty talking, folks. Well, pastor, just words in a book. No, it's God speaking to us. I will never leave you. Quit looking anxiously about for something that ain't there. I am here. But Father, you don't understand what I go through, really? You don't understand what so-and-so did to me last week or what they said about me, really? When did I close my ears off from listening to what my people are going through? When did I shut my eyes not to look upon what my people are going through? Do not look anxiously about you. I am with you always. We go through stuff in our life that causes us or tries to cause us to separate from God. Well, God's not enough for me in this, really. You realize, and I've said this many, many times, the enemy, devil, Satan, Lucifer, had to go to the throne room of God and ask permission to sift Job. Satan even had to go to the throne room of God and say, hey, can I mess with Jesus? Satan has to get permission to do anything and everything that he accomplishes. You know why God allows him to do everything that we see? Why is that? To create revival in people's hearts, to cling to God and walk away from the enemy. You believe that today? The enemy is under God's control. Whoa! If that ain't a mind blower, I don't know what is. The enemy has to ask permission to sift Herschel. The enemy has to ask permission to surf any, to anybody in this room. And you know what our response would be? <laughs> what Jesus say? Hey, get behind me. Get behind me. Oh, by the way, devil, man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Where is that word at right now? It should be in your lap going into your heart so you can walk with the freedom that Jesus has given you by the word. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In other words, I'm going to carry you through everything you go through. Even if you don't think I'm there, I'm there. When you go through the roughest times in your life, Jesus says, look up. Why do you look up? Because your redemption is growing near. He holds you. He caresses you. He carries you through life situations. Don't ever Ever, 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 ever walk around with this in your mind and your heart. Woe is me. How come this always happens to me? Why am I the only one in the world that goes through this stuff? Really? <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. Those of us in this room who put the Word of God first go through stuff. Why? It's because the enemy is trying to draw you away from the prize. The enemy doesn't want the world. The enemy wants you. So quit looking about you for your, for your Savior, for your resurrection. Guess what? When you've asked him in your heart, where's he at? He's right here. Where'd you go, Lord? Hey, I'm still here, man. And I will never leave you or forsake you. 
I will carry through you through every situation. Folks, hear me when I say this. And I hope like maybe that's why our bishops don't come back if I've been so many people. Yeah. You have no right to walk around with a big Eeyore face on your face. You have no right because Jesus lives in you. You have no right to walk around with my life. Why is my life so bad? Because in you dwells victory. That's right. Victory. You know what victory means? I'm not talking about World War I victory, World War II victory, Vietnam loss victory, or whatever. I'm talking about victory that can only come from heaven in you. You are victorious of every lie of the enemy. You are victorious of every lie from your neighbor. You are victorious when someone says, hey, I don't need that. Yes, you do. If anybody says, I don't need that, that's who needs it more than anything. Right. Amen? Amen? Well, the Bible, that's so old. You know what? Thank God it's old. I'll tell you why. Because every trial and tribulation that goes on in our life is answered to in the Bible. Amen? Behold, verse 11, all those who are angered at you will be shamed and dishonored. Whoa. All those who are mad at you and degrade you and call you names will be shamed. What is God saying? God's saying this to Isaiah. Everybody that calls you names, everybody that says something behind your back, I'm going to show their shame to the world. You can't hide when God reveals shame. You can't get away from it. You can try to hide from it, but nothing is hidden from God, folks. The lies that we hear every day on the news is to get you discouraged, to get you wondering what's going on, to get you wondering how come this, how come that. And God says, look, listen here. I have the answer if you pay attention to me and not Joe Politic, man. I am the truth, the way, and the life. Not Joe Politic, man. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. If what they say don't line up with the word, dismiss it. Amen? Go back to Isaiah chapter 40. And I'll start with verse 28. Do you not know? Don't you just love when God talks to you? Oh, that's him talking to Isaiah. No, guess what? God's talking to you through the prophet Isaiah. Right? Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Where does it come from? It comes from God. Take the book seriously. Take the promises in it seriously. I was praying last night. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, when you give something up, what do you do with it? I said, well, I give it up. Do you? Well, remind me, Lord. Don't ever do that. Remind me, Lord. Have I not said, cast all your burdens, all your hopes, all your fears upon me, and I will carry it. That goes for everything in our life, folks. If there's people in your lives that you want to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, give them over and let it go. Because God will deal with it. You don't have the power to deal with it. 
All you can do is speak the truth and let God work out the truth in them. Because I got news for you, folks. Everybody has an excuse for everything. There's a lie for every truth. And there's a truth for every lie. And the enemy wants to convince you it's hopeless. It's hopeless. Do not look anxiously about you. Do not look anxiously about you. Cast it on me and leave it. It's hard to do, isn't it? It's absolutely hard to do. But when the Holy Spirit gives you revelation of what that means, do it. Do not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Have you ever felt weak and all of a sudden you got this brush of woo, Holy Spirit driven power? Yes. Okay. You know when I've experienced that more than any time in my life is when I'm sharing the Lord with somebody and they absolutely rebuke me. And the power of the Lord comes up and says, wait a minute, like a big old rooster. <laughs> like a big old rooster. Wait a minute. You and I are about to have words, brother, and I'll guarantee you my words are stronger than your words. Amen. Amen. Right? Yeah. Because the enemy say, what are, you, what are you doing talking to that person? Don't you know that you're, you're nothing? You think you're all that, but you're not. You know what? Jesus has made me all that, brother. I right? Get behind me, Satan. Verse 30, though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, this is my all-time, well, not me, one of my most favorite scriptures in the Bible. And the other day, I got revelation of what this means. The whole time I'm thinking, Lord, this is such a great scripture. Do you know what it means? Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. You know what that means? Have you ever seen an eagle? Do you know why they build their nest so stinking high up you can barely see them? Because the eagles don't flap their wings. They soar. They soar and they go in circles. Every time they go in a circle, they get higher. And the circle gets bigger. They get higher. And the circle gets bigger. They get higher. And the circle gets bigger. And they never. God's telling you today, let me hear it, Bill Ruth. Let me hear it. Quit working. Quit fluttering, quit flapping your wings and soar with me. And I will take you higher and higher and higher and higher. And your circumference will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Your influence will grow and grow and grow. Why? Because you're mounted on wings like eagles. Quit trying to do it yourself. Quit looking for excuses to try to do it yourself. Strap into that eagle. Put that saddle on and just sit there. Lord, I want to soar. Let the Holy Spirit win. Take me as high as I need to go. Take the Holy Spirit win. Give me an updraft that I can just keep soaring. And my influence gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And what do I mean by that? Your word that's in you will grow those around you if you let it soar in you. You believe me this morning? Look to your left and to your right. What do you see? <clears throat> What do you see? Empty chairs. Empty chairs. You know what those empty chairs are for? For empty lives to sit in. Yeah. Empty chairs are for empty lives to sit in. How does empty lives come to a place to sit in chairs where they can be filled? You. And the power of God in you. 
Quit making excuses for what you do and what you don't do. And quit telling yourself this. More important than anything I've said this morning so far. Quit telling yourself this. I'm not adequate. I don't have the ability. I don't know what to say. You remember when Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to talk about. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Because when the time comes, the Holy Spirit will bring you things. Beyond. Where'd that come, Lord? It came from me. But it won't come from your mind. It comes from your heart. Because that's where the Word dwells. The Word dwells in your spirit. So whenever you're walking around, you walk. I should like to talk to that guy about Jesus. Well, let Jesus lead you to the guy or let the guy come to you. You've all heard my story about me looking at Hawaiian shirts in, what was that at? Willits. And the conversation I have with the, the individual looking at flower Hawaiian shirts. There is no way, no reason for that guy to walk up and if I'm looking for flowery Hawaiian shirts, for him to walk up and start looking the same thing except for this. God said, tell him about me. That's got nothing to do with me, folks. It's got everything to do with him. Amen? And when you drive through a hamburger line and the Holy Spirit says, pray or tell them to be blessed, where's that come from? <clears throat> comes from here. Don't stop soaring. Don't get weary or tired because God will not leave you alone. Now I'll preach you my message. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see what happens. Okay. <clears throat> I think the reason why God's telling us this this morning, and I think it's been building up. Last week we had a, a, a last week we had a, a message on the Bible and the Word, and how important it is to read, how important it is to consume, how important it is to to get it in your spirit. I think what God's trying to tell us of this year and the time that we live in, He's trying to tell us, look, time is short. Time is short. So how can we expect to share Jesus with other people if we can't even share it with ourselves? You come in the doors of this building, and some of you might not know this, I don't know, maybe you feel it with the Holy Spirit saying, man, welcome. I've been waiting for this. No. You brought me with you. And the prayer that goes on in here before the rest of you arrive, the Holy Spirit must get going, man. Amen? So every time someone new comes in here, two things happen. Conviction, which should lead to restoration, or conviction that leads to, I'm out of here. I got my own way of thinking. There's only one way to think, well, Lord, people, and that's about me. Amen? Revelation chapter 22. Don't freak out. <clears throat> if we were sitting here worshiping this morning, the Lord gave me that little intro that I just went through. And as I was sitting there, I always have to say, Lord, I don't want to do this if you're not there. I don't want to stand before these people if you're not there. So sometimes he speaks things into my heart that I have to bring out. But that doesn't mean I can't finish what he gave me, right? We are not told when the end is. We're not told that. We are told about how and the who, but we're not told when. The key is the who. Jesus says, I am the beginning and the end. Jesus says, I am the beginning and the end and everything in between.
There's a difference between the beginning and the end. Sometimes when you start a new process, it doesn't look like it did in the end. Right? When you're done with it. Someone once said, I want to be the welcome committee, not the planning committee. What does that mean? That means I want to be the one that is waiting and anxiously and welcoming the Lord Jesus, not the one planning his arrival. We all know down through the years there's been all kinds of planning his arrival. And what did Jesus say? No one knows. I don't even know, Jesus says. Only the Father, which is in heaven, knows. We can look at all the signs of what's going on, and we know because of the signs of time we're getting real close, aren't we? But don't put a date on it. Don't put a date on it. What we need to do as God's people is to continue walking in what he's called us to walk in and not worry about what's going on around us. Which we can, can't we? We can look at the news and say, oh man, this place is going to H-E-L-L in a bag. Yeah, it is. It is. Exactly. But greater is he in you than he is in the world. Amen. Go to Revelation chapter 22, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 1. <clears throat> then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. We just sang a song this morning about the river of life coming from Emmanuel. In the middle of the street, on either side of the river, was a tree of life bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the, and the levies of the tree were for healing of the nations. Do you understand what God's done here this morning already? He's telling us that in the beginning was a tree. Remember in the garden? Don't eat from that tree. And the last chapter of the Bible says there is a tree of life that produces different fruit for every day of the year. And God's telling us, do not look anxiously about for stuff that you don't know what's going on. I am in control. If I can cause the beginning to come with a tree, I can cause the end for your salvation and your eternity by eating from the tree of life. Isn't that what he's saying? Remember that you are in God's hands. And when you read the book of Revelation, all it does is bring you revelation that you're in God's hands. And the whole book is about Jesus from beginning to end. So when Isaiah tells us, do not look anxiously about you, Revelation tells us, because this is why. And along with every other scripture in it. Amen? Go to verse 7, or verse 6. These words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Verse 7, And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. Not in your time, in my time. In the time that God's already ordained. So Isaiah is telling us, don't look anxiously about, don't worry what's happening, keep your focus on him. He's the author and the finish of your faith. On one translation said, he perfects your faith. How do you get perfected faith? By the word of God. That's how your faith becomes perfected. By the word of God. And I believe that what Isaiah was telling us in 40 and 41, that that just leads us to the promises that God has made to us, which are yes and amen. The Bible also tells us that every word that comes out of his mouth will not return void. It has to accomplish what he's spoken to accomplish. So if Isaiah says, quit worrying about it, quit worrying about it. 
If Isaiah says to quit looking at things so anxiously, but you say, but, take the but, throw in the garbage can. Because in God's presence, unless Jesus uses the word but to show your revelation, but shouldn't be in your vocabulary. Now, when you hear the words like, but God, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? Oh, but God can't help me in this, really? The Bible begins with Jesus in the creation of the universe, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. All the beginning, everything that was created, John tells us in chapter 1, 1 and 3, is that everything that was created was created through Jesus. Jesus was, in the beginning, was the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So what Isaiah is telling us here, also what we went through this morning, is don't worry about tomorrow, because I have you right here. And if the Word has become flesh and dwelt among us, now lives in us because of our profession of faith, amen? We don't need to look anxiously about us. We can mount up on that eagle and soar. I want to caution you in this. When you walk in here on Sunday mornings, some Sunday mornings were 30, 35 people. Some Sunday mornings we have less than this. But don't be discouraged. Don't let that get to you. Don't let that overwhelm you. Well, we must be doing something wrong. No, we're doing something right. The word is going forth. A lot of people can't handle the truth. A lot of people can't handle the word, but our prayer should be this, Lord, bring down that stronghold. So when you speak to their hearts, they can get better at who they are in you. It's easy to get discouraged by what we see. It's even easier to get discouraged by what we hear. How come we don't seem to be growing, Pastor? How you know we ain't? Well, there's no numbers. It doesn't matter the size of the tree. It matters the fruit that comes off of it. Amen? Amen? It doesn't matter how full we are. What matters is how wore out the Bible is. It doesn't matter how many people sit next to you or not sit next to you. What matters is is a word giving them an opportunity to walk in freedom, to be set free, or still remain in bondage. We need to quit looking for the other side of the coin and walk in the one that we have. And I think that's what Isaiah is trying to tell us in those three little scriptures. Is don't worry about tomorrow. Because you're not promised tomorrow. <laughs> and yesterday's gone. You're promised today. It's easy. It's easy to sit when the word is being preached and the Holy Spirit's bringing conviction. It's easy to get up and walk out. Isn't it? Well, I don't want to hear that no more. Maybe you ought to need to hear that no more. Maybe you ought to hear it more and more and more. I'm not saying that to bring condemnation. I'm saying that for, for us to realize it doesn't matter if you look around and see a few empty seeds. It doesn't matter. What matters is what fruit you're taking out of here with you. And what you do with that fruit. Have you ever taken an apple? I did this as a kid. My mom used to beat us up for eating all the apples. We were really not that big. But we'd go in the cupboard and we'd eat all that. I mean, she only could go shopping once a month. From Alturas to uh, Carmel Falls. I mean, it isn't, isn't an easy trip. So she'd go up there and get, you know, all this stuff, and we'd go in there and just, ah. One time I took an apple out of that bag, and I took it to the room where me and my brother sat, and I set that thing on my dresser. I kept telling myself, I'm going to save that apple. When I leave in the day to go to school, I'd cover it up so mom wouldn't see it. You know, that apple was so important to me 
that I didn't consume it when I should have and it got wrong. Isn't that what the Word is telling us? Consume it. Eat it. Nurture it. Let, it. let it flow into your life. Let it bring you refreshing water. Otherwise it goes stagnant. Well, how can the Word of God go stagnant? It goes stagnant in you because you're not producing what it's asking you to produce. You know, there's one thing to belong to, to, you know, whatever we belong to. That's one thing. But what are you doing with who you belong to? What are you doing with that? The Bible also ends. Look at, look at uh, verse 20. Well, let me go to verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Remember me telling you that one day we're going to stand before God and he's going to ask you what you did with him, what you did with his word, what you do? What he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There's no in between. Do not look anxiously about you for I am with you always. And I'm here to hold you up in the righteousness of my right hand. I will match you up on wings as eagles and soar above all your problems and your situations. Let me remind you of some folks. What we go through now in the physical is short compared to what's in front of us for eternity. So we need to stop letting the enemy get over on us and start producing inside of us by the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit a revelation of what the Word means to us and what we're to do with it. We know how the world will end. Just read the Scriptures, right? But it's full of blessings. The Word is full of life blessings that sometimes we don't pay attention to. I don't know, I don't know how else I could put this. Don't worry about what you have no control over. Don't fret after something that you have no control over. Don't look with your eyes those things around you, but look what the revelation of God has done in you. We all, we all can look in the mirror one day and say, man, you're, you're kind of blue. Have you ever, have you ever thought about yourself or told yourself this? One day when I do die, I want to die without regrets. I got a whole train load of regrets. And the enemy always seems to bring those regrets up. And I have to say, you know what, devil, that's been taken care of. That doesn't belong to me no more. So I guess the biggest thing I want you to get today out of this, whatever I'm doing here, is this. God has you in the palm of his hand. God doesn't want you to look for something that ain't there, but look for someone that is there. God doesn't want you to get so lost in what's happening in the world today that you fail to put it all upon him. Can you imagine, and I, I get it, I, every time this, I, I read this in the news or whatever, I'm so amazed, absolutely amazed about how fast the church in China has grown. You talk about opposition. You talk about persecution. But they grow by thousands every day. And they do it with joy. They do it with peace because they know that God has called them to do it. And when they find out where a meeting place is, you ain't keeping them from it. 
They know that any time the Chinese army can come in and just put them all in jail or kill them all, whatever, but they still go and they still meet with God. They might not carry a Bible with them, but someone tells them about Jesus. Our country has lost that flair. The Christian society has lost that desire in this country. My prayer is it comes back. And the only way sometimes things come back is through persecution. When someone comes knocking on your door, or comes to this church, and says, hey, I want every Bible, you can't have no more. What are we going to do? Seriously. Because when you're persecuted, your strength gets stronger. Your hope gets stronger. Your faith gets stronger. Because what happens inside of you burns this desire to please God, not man. And that's what Isaiah is telling us. Don't worry about pleasing man, but please God. Who's the author and the perfecter and the finisher of your faith? Turn to me to John chapter 7. Verse 1 of chapter 22, Revelation tells us about a river of water of life. Doesn't it? Look at, look at verse 37 of chapter 7 of, of John. Let me start with verse 35. The Jews then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go? That we will not find him. He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is the statement that he said? You will seek me and will not find me. Where I am, you must you cannot come. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. From whose innermost being? From whose innermost being? The believer that believes in Jesus, as the scripture said, he will flow river from his innermost being. What does that mean? That means the river of life now is going to flow through you as you walk closer to him. <clears throat> I encourage you to read the rest of Revelation 22. I'm, I'm going to stop right there. I would encourage you to read the rest of Revelation 22. And let the Holy Spirit speak to you through it. Because every chapter of the Bible, you know, I used to look at the, the chapters in Matthew and some of the other places where they had the genealogy. I oh, mean, I don't want to read this. Look at all these names. I can't even pronounce half these names. <laughs> but then you get to read it. Well, this guy begat this guy, and this guy begat this guy, and this guy begat that guy. If that guy hadn't begat that guy, we wouldn't have David. We wouldn't have David. We wouldn't have Jesus. So you look at those word lists, you say, man, I don't want to read that again. Read it and let God develop in you the answer to your dilemma. What am I reading all this for? So as you read the scripture, let the Holy Spirit enlighten you so you can have rivers of living water flowing through you too. Because there's people that you will come in contact with that are going to need that life. Amen? Amen. And who knows? Only God knows. I, I believe this with all my heart that maybe I'm just a wisher. I don't know. Maybe I'm a dreamer. <clears throat> but you know, when God called me to this little church, you've all heard this story before. My wife and I went, no way. Uh, no way am I going to Dobbins, California, <laughs> and preaching to a church where nobody 
we want you there to be. This is back, the old crowd. So it's pretty hard to fight against God, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It absolutely is. And God's the first or second Sunday I was here, I forget now when it was, the Lord spoke to my heart. And you're gonna think I'm crazy. The Lord spoke to my heart, and this is what he said. He said, the worship that happens in this building will be an example to other buildings. Now you might think, Pastor, you're out of your mind. Because back then, we had a worship team that would rock your socks. Lonnie and Amber and a bunch of other guys up here, and the worship, Glenn heard from across the street, they weren't even here yet. But then God does something. He builds upon what he's promised. How many of you know it's pretty rare for a church of 25 people to have three worship teams? Right? Four, actually, on the end of the month on church. Right? Right? So when God tells you something, take it to the bank. Don't look with your eyes what ain't happening. Look what he's promised is going to happen. One of the Sundays we were here, this place was full. There was people standing on the walls in the back. And, and my wife walked up and she tapped me and said, man, look at all the people. And the first, my first impression was this. They're just curious. They're just curious. And the very next Sunday, we had the, the, the church was full. But the rest of the crowds on the sides and stuff were there. And I began to get discouraged. Lord, but you said, he said, yeah, but in my time. Not yours. You just need to stay strong. How many of you know it's pretty hard to stay strong on your own? But I didn't say all that to bring any old folk out. I said this, I said that for this. Don't walk in this building and see empty seats. Walk in this building and see full seats, full of life that people need to come and hear the word. The enemy is out to destroy this church. Well, how do you know that? Just listen to what people are saying. Listen to the negative. And you know, my response is, praise God, praise God, praise God. Why? Because if we were doing it wrong, we might be full, but it wouldn't be right. I'm not here to please anybody. I'm here to please him. Amen? If you get convicted by what's preached or what someone's read to you, that's on you. My responsibility is to convict you with the word for restoration not for condemnation, but for restoration. You may have, you know how many people have gotten upset and angry because what was said, and that we never did it this way, and this and this and that. Maybe it's time you do it another way. Maybe it's time we do it God's way. Maybe it's time that you had lose your control over what happens in God's house and let God work his house. Amen? So let's not get discouraged, folks. Let's keep going forward. And whatever you do, keep your pastor and his wife in prayer. Please? And when you hear someone that needs prayer or needs direction, give a call. Or pray for them. Say, Lord, you don't know how many times I try to call certain people and for whatever reason, phones don't work. We know that it rains up here, everything just goes south. Yeah. Yeah. Right? But anyway, stay encouraged and know that God has you in the palm of his hand. In the righteous right hand. If you hear something from this pulpit that brings you discouragement, think, well, what? Why did I get discouraged? Because I need to do this in you. Amen? Father, thank you for this time. Help us in our discouragement to look toward you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help 
us to always walk in your righteousness. To be upheld by your righteous right hand. That we can walk in your peace and understanding, not the world's peace and understanding. Help us to keep our eyes on you, no matter what we see, no matter what we hear. Father, we know you're close. The signs of the times are telling us that you're close. Help us not to lose faith, not to lose heart, but to continue soaring on top of that evil. We ask today, Lord, that you be with us, each and every one of us. In times of joy, in times of sadness, in times of crisis, in times of overwhelming things that make us even wonder. We ask today, Lord, that you be with us. Travel with us, go before us. And for all those that are on the road today, Lord, that aren't here for whatever reason, I pray you be with us. Bless them, keep them, make them stronger. But more than anything, Lord, let them know that you are with them. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, Amen. Amen.